Okay, we're going to do a quick one here for the difference between divergent and convergent evolution can be a little tricky. Uh, as an example of that, I'm going to use the same organisms in the same little phylogeny tree, right, showing their relatedness to describe both. Because depending on how you explain it, and especially where you start your explanation, these same animals can be examples of divergent or convergent evolution. Okay, so if we start our explanation back here in time, it's going to be about 600 million years or so ago, early in the time of animals. And there is a common animal ancestor back here that gave rise to all of these in a divergent pattern from this common ancestor. The processes of speciation and evolution resulted in these five kinds of animals. One's extinct now, pterodactyls, the rest are around here. And what the evidence is for that divergence is the similarities that these things have, right? Homologies. They have homologous structures, but mostly, most telling, they have homologous DNA sequences. And again, you can tell how closely related they are, and therefore where these branch points are by comparing their DNA sequences, their amino acid sequences basically, but DNA is the best comparison, okay? So um, you would then, uh, you know, you would predict that bats and one of you would show the most similarities based on this because you've been evolving separately from a common ancestor for the least amount of time. Therefore, you piled up the least amount of differences. Okay, what if we start our explanation here? At this point in time, whenever that is, tens of millions of years ago, the ancestors of these birds were also reptiles, right? A common reptile ancestor gave rise to pterodactyls and birds. We've already told that story, okay? But these reptile bird ancestors, they couldn't fly. They had arms, not wings. They couldn't fly. The ancestors of pterodactyls at the same time were ground living reptiles. They couldn't fly, they had arms. Mammals evolved also from reptile ancestors. And when there were still dinosaurs around, there were mammals, not one of you kind of mammals, but there were mammals. And the ancestors of bats at that time were little rodent-like things that also didn't have wings, didn't fly. Of course, you never have wings, but these things have wings over here. But if we go back to this point in time, the um, ancestor of these winged insects is an insect without wings. So, the evolutionary forces that invented wings, so to speak, invented them in one, two, three, four different kinds of things, all quite separately from organisms that didn't have wings. Now, here's where it gets really confusing. First of all, sorry, the fact that these wings evolved for the same function, flight, that's the idea of convergent evolution because evolving to the selection pressures presented by the open air, all the advantages you have if you can get up in the open air and move around, these four different kinds of things all evolve wings. These with stretched skin, with scales on it. These with feathers. These with stretched skin without scales on it, but hair on it. And these with things that didn't have bones in them were nothing like these kind of wings. These are analogous structures, same function, but different independent evolutionary origin. Now it gets a little trickier, right? If we look at the wings of these three things, we can use them as examples of both because all their wings evolve from a forelimb, a front arm, a front arm that this common ancestor had. But in this case, the front arm evolved to have feathers on it. In this case, it evolved to have stretched skin with scales. In this case, stretched skin with hair. So in that case, 
the common bone structure that we emphasized way back then, the most classic example of homology, one of the first, right? That common bone structure would lead you to use these wing examples as examples of homologous structures. The feathers versus stretched skin would be an analogous thing, a convergent thing, same function, but in a different way. These limbs have achieved the same function. But these are clearly analogous, not homologous, because butterflies' wings don't evolve from front limbs. They don't have bone structures, right? They're quite different in structure and origin from these three, and therefore them, compared to any of these three, are analogous structures, examples of convergent evolution. One last thing, a butterfly's wings compared to your arm is neither homologous nor analogous, right? It's not analogous because they don't serve the same function, unless you can fly, right? And they're not homologous because they don't have the same structural similarities. So you see how this can possibly be confusing. I think if they ask you questions about this, um, they're gonna ask you, um, uh, what is this an example of, convergent or, or um, divergent? One point for that, correct answer, and then justify uh, and that's the explanation that I just told you about same function, but different origin and structure. That is analogous structures, uh, ex um, uh, evidence for convergent evolution. Do they maybe have the same function? See, these homologous wings all have the same function. Our arms clearly don't have the same function, but their homology is in their bone structure and their origin from the same ancestral forelimb. That homology suggests relatedness and therefore divergence from a common ancestor with the forelimb. Got it? Got it. make my final set of comments here on phylogeny trees okay so here we have one which of these is most closely related to salamander if that was the kind of question well the shark would be least related to the salamander why because the common ancestor they share is longer ago than the common ancestor that the salamander shares with these other three okay so which of these other three is it most closely related to? Well, it's equally related to all three. Even though the alligator's name might be closer, that means nothing in terms of how closely related they are because all three of these have been evolving away from this common ancestor from the salamander for the same amount of time. And therefore, they're equally closely related. You would expect then to find equal numbers of differences in your DNA sequences. They might be different differences, a salamander compared to an alligator and a salamander compared to a lizard, but you'd expect to find equal numbers or really closely equal numbers because they've been evolving separately, piling up those differences for the same amount of time. Whereas a shark and a salamander have been evolving separately for a greater amount of time therefore greater differences. This is a classic kind of question. Which would you predict would have the greatest number of differences compared to a salamander? So equally related to three of the others is the answer to that one. And now this one last. Here was the picture we just looked at, right? Here's the diagram that if we ask the same question, we have the same answer. Even though now the human and the salamander are closer to each other, name-wise, where last time it was the salamander and alligator, the same thing applies. If you look at these two, you can see what was done. At this node, 
That's what that's called, remember? It represents a common ancestor to whatever things diverge off of it. If you take this node and you just rotate it, that's exactly what's happened here. You don't change the meaning of this at all. That's why you have to be careful to not think that if their names are close to each other, that means they're closely related. It all has to do with where these nodes are, where the branch points are. Got it? Capiche.